as we move along. What's that? All right, Dorothy just said she didn't know I was all this, so I don't talk about it too much, but the second page is my, for, is for those of you that think I only scuba dive and take pictures and take care of the fish here, okay? I, so when, you, when I, you ask me questions, I have actually done some of this before. I'm not just a fish keeper. Um, so I thank you all for coming. The good news is we don't have enough handouts for everybody. They're printing, but that means that much more people came than expected, which is a great thing. So, this is the first of our monthly series, and I just want to say that as opposed to a lecture, what we really want this to be is we want this to be an opportunity for people to share their concerns with each other and share solutions with each other. I would say probably 75% I know of what I know about cardiovascular and pulmonary disease I've learned from my patients, and especially things that you know will really help you improve the quality of your life. So I wanted to say that this is your time. So I have a plan for where I'm going to go with this, but if you have a question or a comment, by all means, stop me right in the middle if you want to say something. Uh, I'm not going to get thrown off by what you say. And the other thing is that we can go in whatever direction people want and need to, okay? So this is the first night, so I think it would be just good if we took about five minutes to introduce ourselves, to say who you are. If you want to say why you're here, you're welcome to. If you don't want to say why you're here, you're welcome to do that. If you don't want to be on camera, no problem. We'll put a big black blah blah and disguise your voice. Um, so don't worry. If you do want to be on camera, that's great. Um, but if we do anything with it, we'll of course get your permission first. So if you don't know me, uh, my name is Noah and I'm the program director here and the fish keeper. Um, and tonight's topic is ultimate pulmonary wellness. So this is something that I've done quite a bit of for quite a long time, 20 years or more, really more than 20, 20 years. And our center, since we opened in 1998, we treated more than, basically more than 53,000 exercise sessions. Wow. So we've done more of this than pretty much anyone else in the country. So if you ask us something, even though it looks like we're fooling around or we're not sort of, you know, we're joking around, this is something that we do day in, day out. Um, and if we don't know the answer, we'll tell you. I mean, it's, you know, every once in a while Dorothy tries to stump me, but, um, <laughs> you know, but I will always, you know, I'll never say something if I don't know it or if I have an experience. So, um, again, this is for you guys, so feel free to ask whatever questions you want, make whatever comments you want. And um, I will now introduce uh, one of my partners, Cynthia, who uh, you can introduce yourself and um, tell us a little about what you do. I'm Cynthia Rivez, and I have a company called Essential Balance Healing. And I do energy healing sessions, and I also coach and teach people about wellness principles, how they can work to create an internal environment that fosters and encourages healing. So I'm really happy to be here with you today and to share some tools with you. Yes. Noah and Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia. Hi. Hi. Would you be talking about what you do? Yes. Okay. I just want to do a real quickie, but when I go up afterwards and I will be happy to answer questions. She's act two. Okay. If you're still awake after Act 1, Cynthia will talk. <laughs> Dina. Hi, everyone. I'm Dina Dennis, and I am a teacher and dancer and choreographer, and love doing collaborative work with other artists of all ages. Um, I also have to introduce Nicole Sledek, who is a, a collaborator of mine, and we do a lot of work together, performance-wise. I'm here tonight to share some dance with you some great exercises and dance-based movements based in ballet, modern, jazz, and yoga. And this are these are exercises you can try at home. You can also do here. It makes you feel good and it's dance-based. So <coughs> Okay, Dorothy, would you like to lead us off? Oh definitely. Mm. I, knew, I knew I came to the right spot. So you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself if you wish, or you could just say your name and we'll move on. Yeah, my name is Dorothy Strong, and uh, I've been coming here for about four months, I don't know, a year, uh, off and on with 
couple of accidents and <laughs> a couple of illnesses, but I think they have been coming back again. So, um, and I find it, I find it's very, very helpful. The staff is excellent. They really are, you know, watching out for me, take care, and attend to everything. So I'll just say, if you don't want to speak, just say your name and then, <laughs> and then we'll know to move on. Okay. Rachel? Rachel, I've been coming here for a while with, with Noah, and I love Noah. He's a wonderful man, good exercise and therapist. <laughs> Thank you. And I love it. Um, I'm Suzanne Black. I'm my mother's daughter. My mother was very sick with very severe lung disease and Noah put her back together. She wound up in the hospital with pneumonia, almost didn't make it, made it, and now is coming back to Noah to get fixed up again. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist by trade. I, was, I did my internship in rehab medicine and neuropsychology at Rusk Institute where Noah was at for many years. And I, I do a uh, private practice and uh, done a lot of hospital work and done tons of stuff, cardiovascular work, work with Dean Ornish. But that's me and I have asthma. That's my, my contribution to the year. Hi, my name is Esther martinez Leonard, and this is my first time here. Welcome. I have uh, chronic asthma and I have to get serious about it. What did you say, Esther? Yes, uh, you have what? Chronic asthma. My name is uh, Reba Holmes, and I'm here to feel better because I have a, a slight case of asthma. And I'm here to learn you know, and just get better, feel like I did 10, 15 years ago. That's why I'm here, too. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not really leaving. I'm here because it keeps me walking. <laughs>
Hi, <clears throat> I'm Diane Jackson. I've been coming here now two years, and I have to say to everybody, it's been a magnificent two years. When I started here, I was totally out of breath, couldn't walk up a flight of stairs. <coughs> Today, it's altogether different. It's like I'm a brand new person. That's why I can come here every Thursday and Friday at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> but it's been wonderful. The staff here is wonderful. I don't wish anybody illness of any kind, but I just wish I knew more people that could benefit from the sessions here. Manya. My name is Manya Kowalewski, and I've been a bit more than two years here. I love it. I can only say wonderful things. I love my boss. <laughs> I call him my boss. Although I have another Fred boss. Fred is your boss. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear, Fred is <laughs> my husband. But everything here is wonderful. And if I have a bit of a, let's say, cold or something and I miss it, I really miss it a lot. I tell my husband I want to do, I have to do, because I'm a different person too. I, I do everything, you know, and I don't know. I get dressed, I love to close, I love to eat, I love everything. I love life. And, and I find it here. So I, I want to thank my Thank wife. you. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. I'm Fred Kobleski, and I'm married to this charming <laughs> lady for a lot of more years than you'd uh, like to know. but. It's true that over the two years plus, there's been an enormous difference in Manya's physical condition. She may be in better shape now than she was, let's say, 50 years old. She's really in good shape, and uh, we owe it to know. Right. I'm Susan Paston. I'm actually a little camera shy too, although I'm not notably shy in any other way. <laughs> and I've been coming here for we'll about a year. Why have you behind the black circle? I'm behind the black circle, okay. And I've been coming here for about a year. <coughs> and I'm Raja Shaheen, and I'm a somatic practitioner. And I come here because it's my social life, <laughs> is what I decided. I come here with this. What does that mean? It's because it makes me feel good to be here. And I have pulmonary hypertension, a lot of other one thing. But the family, the personal support that we get here, and the skill of each practitioner and how they care makes all the difference in the world. And I leave here happier than I did when I came in. Yeah. Last but not least. Uh, I'm Marjorie Boyer. And I, yeah. <laughs> I went from a 10-mile runner to not being able to walk two blocks, mm -hmm. and no one's helping me get my life back, and I am most grateful. Um, one more gentleman, I'm sorry. Dauda. Yeah, my name is Dauda. I'm a genetic woman. I've been here for more than 30 years, and uh, I work with the city of New York, the public health epidemiologist, humanization. Um, I came to Noah because my daughter told me I need to improve my breathing and to go and learn how to use a cappella. And like we all, we all said, I have to thank him because he gave me a reduced rate. I couldn't afford what my insurance company said. Come on in, just come in post, you know, and I'm grateful to you. And this is my second time of coming here. And when I saw this, don't see that, I just have, I have to come today. And hopefully, I'm, 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 I'm still improving. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. That was the second reference to acapella, and I have no idea what that is. Um, we will talk about it. Okay. There's a third reference. My mother uses it. Oh, I didn't hear that. Use it here. <laughs> All right. So let's get rolling on ultimate pulmonary wellness. So, like I said, if you have a question, please ask because probably someone else has the same question. But the goal tonight is for you. One, one thing I find is that a lot of times when people come here, even though they've had a pulmonary problem for a long time and have been seeing a pulmonologist for a long time, there's really quite a bit of misunderstanding out there as to what is really going on. I have people who come in and say, 
I have emphysema, but I don't have COPD, or I have COPD, but I don't have asthma. Um, and there's a lot of confusion. And in today's fast-paced healthcare world, um, you know, doctors do not have the time to sit and explain to you what is going on. And so one of the biggest, one of the greatest things and one of our greatest enemies is the internet. So very often people are left to their own devices and what you read on the internet is not always checked for facts and it's not always the most helpful thing for you. So one of the things that we try to do here in addition to exercise you, because we could basically take a donkey, put it on the treadmill, each week increase its speed and incline a little bit and that donkey is going to get stronger and faster and fitter but he's still not going to be able to take care of himself okay so part of what we do here is we want you to become more educated consumers slash patients slash individuals so that you have a better way of taking care of yourself so that when you go to the doctor and he says oh yeah but take these three things and but you can say what are you talking about and but have at least a little bit of a basis for what's going on so tonight's ultimate pulmonary wellness, and you know, I just laid claim to the website ultimatepulmonary.com, okay, because I think that there's something to that. And I think that we have a lot of information that other people don't, and we get results that other people don't. It's because our program is a lot different. If you go and you read the literature, or you go to any other pulmonary rehab in the world, pretty much, with the exception of Tel Aviv University, what you're going to find is people walking on the treadmill at an extremely slow pace for a very long time, okay? And what we do is we have people walking on the treadmill at a fast pace and uphill, okay? So if you read the literature, there will, there will be hundreds of articles that say pulmonary rehab, people get more, they have, are less short of breath, they feel better, they can do more, but there's no change in pulmonary function, okay? So there's no improvement in pulmonary function. So isn't that discouraging that you go through a 12-week program and then you go to your doctor and you're ready to take that pulmonary function test and he says, there's no change. And you were hoping that he was going to say it's 90% better, okay? So how come he feels better and he can do more? We're going to talk about that. That's what tonight is all about, okay? So tonight is very basic. We're going to set the stage for the next several months, but ultimate pulmonary wellness, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I want to define each of those words except ultimate, because you probably know what that means already. But let's start with the most basic, pulmonary, okay? What do people, how many people on a scale of 1 to 10 think they have, or let's say A, B, C, D, F, how many people think they have A-level understanding of the pulmonary system? Is that low? A is the best, so you're an A okay. student. So how many people think they are, have an expert understanding or an A level understanding? How many people think they have a B level? C level? Okay, so a couple of C's. Average, right? That's the average student. Drinks at night, sleeps in in the morning, but still manages to graduate from college. Um, how about D level? So that's the guy who once in a while goes to school, okay, but still manages because his parents have a lot of money that they donate to the school, so they graduate. How many people have an F? Okay. So that's a problem, right? So if you don't understand the pulmonary system, but you have a chronic pulmonary disease, how bad is that? That's like saying you have a garage full of cars, but you don't know how to drive. Yes, ma'am? Other than coming here, if I had a call here, I was coming, would you go to get that? Where should you go to get it? Oh, you can go to medical school, but that's not that realistic. Um, but you should really be able to ask your doctor. When your doctor says you have COPD, besides saying, what is COPD? I mean, you should have an understanding of what does that mean? COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I mean, we know what disease means. Some people know what chronic means, obstructive, Probably most people don't know what that means. In pulmonary, maybe you have an idea of what it means. So when you think of pulmonary, let's start with that. What do you think of? The lung. The lung, okay? So let's, let's break it down like this. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll take the pulmonary system part by part. So everybody knows that you have two lungs, right? You have a right lung and a left lung. 
Everybody knew that, right? Does anybody know that the, lo the lungs are broken up into lobes? Anyone hear that before? Okay, so the, the right lung, so this is the right. Because this is as if we're standing and, and the patient is facing, or the person is facing us. Here's the left. So the right lo lung has three lobes. And the left lung basically has two lobes, okay? What are the other parts of the respiratory system besides the lung or the pulmonary system? So listen to this. Pulmonary means respiratory, right? So what are the other parts? Diaphragm. The diaphragm, okay? Anyone know what the, how many people know what the diaphragm is? Okay. Now remember, this is the pulmonary center. We're not talking about birth control, okay? <laughs> sorry, I had to, I sorry, I, I, I'm very immature. So anyway, um, okay, so what is the diaphragm? It's a muscle, good, excellent. So what does the diaphragm do? So the diaphragm, first of all, here's what you should know about the diaphragm at the most basic level, okay? It's dome-shaped, so it comes like this, it sits under the lungs, and what does it do? It what? It moves up and down, okay? So we're going we're gonna to show that by showing you that it moves up and down. With, we'll get another... Now let's go outside of the respiratory system for one second, just for a little bit of perspective. What's underneath the diaphragm? The stomach, so the abdominal contents, right? So that's the stomach, the intestines, and all that other stuff, okay? So down here is our gastrointestinal system, right? But parts of the gastrointestinal system also run up to here, right? What, what else do we have for the pulmonary system? So we have our lungs and we have our diaphragm. So let's stick with the diaphragm for one second. I'm going to tell you a fact about the diaphragm, okay? This is the most important thing you have to know about the diaphragm. The <coughs> diaphragm is the main muscle of? Breathing. Okay, so now we're going to break, you might say breathing, which is true, but we're going to break breathing down into two parts, right? So what are the two parts of breathing? Inspiration, expiration, expiration, right? So the diaphragm, what you need to know about it, is it's the main muscle of inspiration, okay? So when does the diaphragm inspire or when do the lungs inspire? When the diaphragm contracts up or down? Okay, so the diaphragm contracts downward, right? So just to put it in perspective, if this is my bicep, my bicep contracts to bend my elbow. So when this diaphragm contracts downward, right? What that does is it creates a negative pressure, and I'm not going to get that scientific, but just imagine this pressure is created negatively, and that's what inflates the lungs. <coughs> Got it? So the diaphragm is the main muscle of inspiration, okay? It contracts downward, that creates a, a sucking pressure that inflates the lungs, and the lungs fill up. Okay? Makes sense. So the diaphragm has to get its stimulus from somewhere, right? So where does it, how does the diaphragm know to breathe? The nose. You, you're saying that the nose knows? <laughs> how does the diaphragm know it's time to breathe? Brain. The brain, okay, Marguerite. And I know you know that, Marguerite, because you're a psychologist, so you know a lot about the brain, okay? So let's go, and we're going to put this all together. I'll put it back in order for you at the end, but we're going to do the Mr. Potato Head version of the respiratory system. So the brain responds to three main things, okay? And there's a part of the brain that you probably haven't thought about since high school when they teach you about it, but the, the main part of the brain that's responsible for respiration is called the medulla, okay? How many people have heard of the medulla? Okay way back then, but we haven't thought about it in a long time. So here we go. The brain, the medulla, the respiratory center in the medulla responds to three main stimuli. Because you don't have to think about breathing unless you're doing something, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't be able to sleep because we'd stop breathing. So you don't have to sit there and go, okay, breathe. Okay, breathe. Okay, breathe. I can't just go, okay, drink. Okay, drink. I have to think about it and I have to drink, right? But well, we don't have to do that with breathing because the brain is telling us it's responding to certain chemical factors that will send a signal that we have to breathe. 
So what do you think those chemicals are that do that? First, CO2. CO2, okay, which is carbon dioxide, right? So that's great, and I'm glad you said it first because it really is first. A lot of people think that oxygen is the main stimulus for breathing. Everybody thinks that if my oxygen goes down, I have to breathe. But it's in fact, if my carbon dioxide goes up, and carbon dioxide is waste product, okay? So if that goes up, that's the first stimulus to breathing, okay? Now keep that in mind because lay, way, later down, way, way, way down, it may be tonight, it may be in a few weeks from now, I'm gonna talk about something that's very common in people with respiratory disease, called carbon dioxide retainers, okay? Because that's very common in people with COPD, and then that, they have to shift to a different chemical type of, of breathing, okay? What's number two? Judy. Oxygen. Oxygen, okay? So we got, so it's, it's a rise in, in carbon dioxide, a low oxygen, okay? So those are two things that are gonna send signals to the brain to breathe, okay? And Judy, if you get this one, I will be pleasantly surprised. I have no idea. Okay, anyone, if anyone gets this one, I'll give you a thousand bucks at the end of this lecture. Okay, anyone know what the third one is? Yep. All right, I saved my money, thank God. I, I knew you weren't gonna get this one, but it's called hydrogen ion. Okay, was anyone gonna say that? Yeah, I would. So here's the thing, <laughs> hydrogen ion, all it means in simple terms, because we're not going to think about H+, what it means is that the blood is becoming more acidic, okay? So like we've heard of lactic acid, like when you're working really hard and you get that pain in your muscles, that acid goes back and sends a message to the brain that says you have to breathe because we got something going on down here that we're not sure what it is, but we don't like it, okay? Make sense? All right, any questions so far? So we talked about the medulla, that's the respiratory center. It responds to low CO, rather high CO2, high carbon dioxide, low oxygen, high hydrogen ion, or more acetic blood, okay? So now the brain understands that we have to do something. So how does it stimulate the, um, how does it stimulate the diaphragm to contract? Anyone know? Probably What's that? It's probably an enzyme. It's not an enzyme, it's a nerve, okay? Anyone know what nerve stimulates the diaphragm? Anyone ever hear of... Vagus? Vagus would be a great guess, because vagus nerve is, is extremely involved in metabolism and exercise, but it's not, it's the phrenic nerve, okay? The phrenic nerve, okay, is innervated by what we call C345, okay, which means that you have vertebrae, and C vertebrae is our cervical vertebrae, our neck, right? So after the first cervical vertebrae, we have two nerves that come out, second, third, fourth, fifth. So C345, so the nerves that come out of the third, fourth, and fifth vertebrae stimulate the, the diaphragm. The diaphragm contracts downward, and the lungs inflate. Are you gonna? Have, I'd like to. Do you have a copy of this? Because I just made it up. I'll no, write it down for you later. Though no, I will make a copy of it. I will. I will yes. make give you a copy of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't realize we were gonna go into anatomy, but I will get you this. Okay. I will get you a copy of this. But I, I like the drawing of it, so we put well, it together. I'll have if I gave you the copy now, you'd have all the answers. I would have already lost a thousand bucks. Um, <laughs> Barbara. I don't know if I'm Brilliant question, okay, great question. So she said, what if you have a cervical problem, right? So how many people have heard the term herniated disc? How many people have felt a herniated disc, okay? So if you have a herniated disc, okay, so here's your spine, and you have the vertebrae that sit like this, right? And coming here you have your disc in between it, and you have your disc here and the nerves come out over here. So if this disc is all the way over here and pushing on your phrenic nerve, you might have trouble breathing. I had a patient one time who was a painter, okay? And he did a lot of stuff up in this position and he was painting and look what's happening to my cervical spine right now. Imagine that happening for hours a day, hours a day. 
And what wound up happening to him was he had a paralyzed diaphragm, okay? Hemi-diaphragm, half his diaphragm was paralyzed. So when he takes a breath in, okay, the, the diaphragm can actually be considered as two hemi-diaphragms, right? So one part contracts while the other part doesn't. So imagine if this one contracts all the way down and this lung inflates all the way, but this one doesn't, that's going to be a smaller lung on that side. It makes I sense? What's that? I have a problem. With the diaphragm? Yeah, with the diaphragm and herniated disc. Herniated, yeah, 100%. And that's a double issue because then we have to treat the orthopedic side of it as well. What's in between here and here? So we, we, we have part where we have parts of the respiratory system that are left out, right? So let's fill in this guy's head. And we have the nose. And we have the mouth, right? So here's where respiration begins. So you can take in air through your nose. You can take in air through your mouth. And it meets in the middle in something called the, the pharynx. So you have the nasopharynx for your nose, the oropharynx for your mouth. It meets in the back at something called the pharynx. And then I heard somebody say trachea, right? So trachea is windpipe. And the trachea basically starts right here. You can feel it. Okay, you can feel the cartilage. Air comes in here. And if you feel over here, you should have a little bit of a um, <laughs> flood, like a little ridge over here. And that's where the trachea splits into the main stem bronchi. Okay? So we have bronchi, so we've all heard the term bronchitis. If there's a, the word itis at the end of something, that means inflammation of whatever that is. So bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchi. Okay? Then what happens is these continue to split. So we have the right lung and we get an upper, middle, and lower. Left lung, we get upper, lower, and something called the lingula. And then it continues to branch smaller and smaller. And then we have the alveoli. Right? How many people know what the alveoli are? They're the air sacs, right? So the air sacs, think of them as like a bunch of grapes, right? So each grape expands and contracts, expands and contracts. But when you have something like COPD, okay, those grapes become unstable, and then what you wind up happening is instead of a whole bunch of little grapes, you have one big floppy grape, and that grape doesn't want to expel air. So that's the respiratory system. Does that shed any light on it? Does anyone learn something surprising about the system? Why does that, um, when, when that happens with the alveoli, <coughs> how does that happen? Do all the boundaries get distorted? Well, what happens is you have little uh, <coughs> structures that support it, and those structures get broken down, okay. and they become just these One bits, big, big flop, exactly. It's like a big floppy balloon. So now, any questions about the respiratory system? Yes? Could we do a little bit of bronchitis? Because I'm not exactly sure why I have that old talk. 100%. Okay. Let's start with this. Shortness of breath. How many people here have experienced shortness of breath? Okay. So the overwhelming majority of people that come here, that is their number one symptom. Okay. We could call this the shortness of breath center, and we would still get the same number of people, whether they know why they're short of breath or not. But what's important to understand, and what people don't realize a lot of times is, you feel worse, you feel better. You're more short of breath, you're less short of breath. Because you feel less short of breath, that does not mean that your lungs have gotten worse. Because you feel less short of breath, that does not mean that your lungs have gotten better. Because breathing and respiration is multifactorial, okay? So that means that there are many things that go into making you feel better or worse, and tonight we're going to talk about many of them. Okay, so when we talk about shortness of breath, most often people start to get short of breath at high levels of exertion. So by that, in New York City, what I mean is climbing the subway stairs, okay, walking uphill, walking fast, running for a bus. Those are the three things I hear most often. Walking up subway stairs, why? Because they're meant to save space. And so they're very steep, they're very long, and you have to take your whole body and pull it up the stairs, okay? It's not like, you know, riding a bike where you have all these mechanical helps with you, okay? You have to pick yourself up and bring yourself up the stairs. Walking uphill, same thing. You have to pick yourself up and walk up that incline. So how many people have walked from, from let's say, Lexington to Park on 34th Street? That's probably like a 25% incline, 
Okay? So when we have people who are 85, 90 years old walking on a 50%, 15% incline, and people go, wow, what's going on here? It's because unless you do that, you're not going to get better. Okay? And when I spoke about other programs before, if your life requires you to work out at level 5, and I work you out at level 2, you can do that till the cows come home, but that doesn't make your life better, okay? So our goal here is if your life requires level five, I want to exercise you at level 10 so that you say well, get, walking upstairs is easier or walking uphill is easier for me. So again, when people start to get short of breath, generally it happens at high levels of exertion, okay? The problem with that is that when people start to get short of breath at high levels of exertion, they stop doing the activities that cause them shortness of breath. So I've heard people say, I don't take the subway anymore. I've heard people say, I know the blocks by the hills, and so I go a different way. I've heard people say, if I see the bus is there, and I think about, I think about running for it, but I wait for the next bus, okay? So that sounds reasonable, but the problem with that is that when you start to avoid those activities, okay, all the muscles of your body, including the diaphragm, including the heart, but also the muscles of the legs, the muscles of the arms, the muscles of your <laughs> thorax and your pelt, you know, your torso, get weaker. And when the muscles get weaker, they are less efficient, you become deconditioned, and the muscles don't use oxygen as well, and then you start to get short of breath at lower levels of activity. Sound familiar? Okay, yes. How big a role does food play? Okay, so Are you going to talk about that later? I'll talk about that, yeah, but, but we'll talk about it. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk a little about nutrition tonight, a little about nutrition. But just in the, in the very quick, okay, we said that the diaphragm contracts downward and that that's what causes the lungs to inflate, right? So the diaphragm's here. What did we say was under here? Yes. All right, so let's say I take this cheeseburger and I put it in here. And now I take some fries and I put them in here. And I take a shake and I put it in here. And then, you know, I'm walking, I, I see the Snickers at the counter and I put that in there too, okay? So now that diaphragm has to push down against a burger, fries, shake, and the Snickers, okay? So there's number one, a mechanical resistance to breathing, okay? So if the diaphragm can't pull down as much, that means the lungs can't open up. So here's a story that I hear a lot. We went out to dinner last night, okay? I don't understand what happened. I was fine walking to the restaurant, but on the way home I had to stop five times to catch my breath, okay? Well, I say, well, what'd you have for dinner? They say, well, I had a cheeseburger, fries, a shake, and a Snickers bar. So did you have any alcohol? Yeah. Oh, well, alcohol is a respiratory suppressant also, okay? So you see how that plays a giant role, okay? But here's something else that people don't know. And this is why when you go to 99% of nutritionists, what they tell you is terrible for you because they don't understand pulmonary physiology, okay? So they want to give you a diet that is rich in, car in healthy carbohydrates, right? Low in fat, high in good protein, except for one thing. Remember what we said is the number one stimulus for breathing? CO2. CO2. So let me let you in on a little secret that most nutritionists probably should know, but it's not really in the, in the food pyramid. The byproduct of carbohydrate metabolism is CO2. Okay? So your doctor's going to say, hey, why don't you have a big pasta meal and you, you know, process all that pasta and now you know what your medulla is saying? Breathe, 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 breathe. So if you have a problem breathing and you have to go, it's a big problem, right? So for somebody who is, you know, looking to gain weight, who has a pulmonary disease, and you're now given, why don't you have six bottles of Ensure per day, okay? And it's loaded with carbohydrates, loaded with sugar, okay? And you know what sugar is, right? Carbohydrates. So you see how that plays a role in it as well, okay? So any questions about the pulmonary system before we move on a little bit? Barbara. The comments you just made about Yes. That's for people with COPD or pulmonary problems. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. But everyone, you know, everyone is going to have that. You know, the diaphragm works the same in most people. So, but there are certain things that are specific to people with pulmonary disease. Okay. 
Okay. I have a problem with the left one. Okay. Because of the high operation. So this is very common, okay? A lot of times when people have open heart surgery, one of the things that's important during open heart surgery is that the heart beats very slowly, okay? So that they can operate. You don't want the heart going like this and you're going up. So they have to cool the heart down to slow the metabolism and they ice it. And a lot of times the icing, okay, can cause a phrenic nerve palsy. And remember, the phrenic nerve is the, is the nerve that in, innervates the diaphragm. So a lot of times after heart surgery, people will have a, a paralyzed hemidiaphragm. Yeah. You told me not to worry about He's your surgeon? <coughs> I bet your lawyer would say something different. But, um, you know, it's, it's all about do you need, you know, he doesn't want you to worry about it. It's not going to kill you, but it may make your life more uncomfortable. So if I have asthma and I'm a big carb person, you know, so what you're saying is that the carbs exude the CO2 and that's going to give me problems. And I, um, it may make you more short of breath. It may stimulate it may respiration. Okay. So imagine it like this: if I if I give you a bucket and I want you to, or I want you to carry a, a bucket of water and the bucket's half full. Okay, but. But I now need you to, to fill this up as fast as possible. And you're working as hard as you can, and we're, we're now continuing to increase the workload to where you can't carry it anymore. That's the same type of thing. So for people who already are respiratory compromised, you want to stack the odds in your favor. And what I want to teach you is how to stack the odds in your favor to get the most out of your respiratory system. And there are things that you can do that will really stack it up in your favor, and there are things that you can do that are really going to go against you. Got it. What role does mucus play in breathing? Here's the role that mucus plays, okay? Your lungs are supposed to be a four-lane road, right? So if you have airway inflammation, then that becomes swollen, and now we've reduced it to a, a two-lane road, right? And now we have mucus. So mucus is like the double park cars. So you want to get your air in, as best you can, except we have inflammation that just closed two lanes in the street, and now we have double park cars. You're not going to be moving a lot of air in and out. So mucus plays a big role. So if mucus is a problem for you, it's to your advantage to get it going. Okay? So I just have to ask a question right now because we're coming close to the time where I'm supposed to stop and turn it over. If we run over a little bit, is that okay with people? So would you rather me stop right now, or can I get like 10 more minutes, and then we'll move on, and we'll stay a little later? I've got 10 more hours. We're going to do this every month. Okay, I will stay as long as people want to. Dina, I don't know if, if you're in a rush, or, or Cynthia. I will, I, I, if I could get like 15 more minutes, I could really hammer these home. Um, you know, no problem. If you have to leave, you know, by all means, but, but I will, if I could get like, Ten more minutes. I'll, I'll make it ten more minutes because let's get into ultimate pulmonary wellness. Okay. So ultimate pulmonary wellness. So we talked about what is pulmonary, right? Now what is wellness? What does wellness mean to you? Because most places I go, if it's a hospital or a doctor's office, they're not talking about wellness. They're talking about sickness. Okay. And that's a problem because a lot of doctors have this idea like, well, you're 90. What do you want? <laughs> right? Or, well, you're 65, what do you want? Or, well, you have a lung disease, get used to it, right? But they're not thinking about all these other things that can go into play. So what do they do? They give you medicines. And if you well, I'm still sure about it. They give you more medicines. So take more of them, take them more often, and take them more frequently, and take bigger doses of them. So take more of them, more frequently, bigger doses, right? Sounds good, but how many people really feel better from more medicine? Not too many, okay? So again, we try to operate on a different model, which is not sickness, but wellness. So what can we do to really make you feel well, okay? Because I know a lot of people here that I can look at you, okay, and you may look a certain way, but if I didn't see what you look like and you told me some stories, I would have no idea how old you are, okay? You don't have to say it, but I am looking around this room. I know there's a lot of people that are over 50, I know there's a lot of people over 60, I know there's a little few people that are over 70, I know there's a bunch of people over 80, and I'm looking around and I know there's at least three people or four people in this room that are over 90. My 101 year old lady is not here tonight, but I know there's at least four people in this room that are over 90, and you're here because you want to feel better, right? Most people your age, 
are dead, okay? You're still here, okay? And, you, and I'm saying that because I'm not saying that to say you should be dead. I'm saying you're here because you want to live and you want to feel good. And so if you're here to fight and you're here because you want to feel well and you want to get more out of life, then don't you deserve to have a doctor that's willing to take that fight with you and say, we'll fight together, instead of somebody who's going to say, well, what do you want? You're 80. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And that makes a big difference. So if you look at my Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness, I've divided it into five areas, okay? And number one is medical. What do I mean by medical? By medical, I mean you have to have the right doctor, okay? If your doctor, every time you go in and says, get used to this, or, you know, if, if you just have to get used to it, then you don't really need a doctor, right? You can stay home and try to get used to it. But you want somebody who's going to help you feel better. So you have to have the right doctor. And if you don't like your doctor, or if you have a feeling that something's not quite right about your doctor, or you have a feeling that you're not getting the best care that you could get, guess what? If you don't like CVS, you could go to Dwayne Reed, okay? There's plenty of doctors out there. I know plenty that are great. I know plenty that are, you know, are really bad, and there's a lot of really bad ones. So if you suspect something's wrong, probably there is something wrong, because you know yourself better than anybody. And if your doctor's telling you that this is what you can expect, and what do you want me to do, then I would say, thank you very much, that's it, okay? So having the right doctor is very important. If you ever want a recommendation, I know, I, I know hundreds of doctors, I work with probably 25 doctors, and those 25 doctors are people who I know personally, who I know the way they treat their patients, and if I give you a recommendation, you can put that recommendation in the bank, because it means I've known them for a long time. I never refer to somebody who I don't know, okay? Or because or I've heard some good question. So, uh, expecting or not expecting improvement, all very functions, that's the yes. Does that really matter if the quality is improved? Yes. It can improve, okay? So here's the general thinking amongst pulmonologists. If I see, a, and I used to feel this way, I used to feel that if I see a patient a year later and their pulmonary function test is the same as it was a year ago, that's a good thing, okay? And that's what I used to think until we opened the Pulmonary Wellness Center and we started really cranking on people and getting people to work out at super vigorous levels. And over time, people started coming back and saying, hey, you know, my doctor said I had a 7% increase and uh, he said he can't believe it. That almost never happens. And it started happening more and more and more. But it's, you gotta put all the pieces together, okay? So it's like a pro athlete, okay? If you uh, exercise every day, if you eat all the right foods, if you have good rest and things like that, the machine will work better. If you do the wrong things, the machine is gonna work worse, okay? So medical, having the right doctor, taking the right medications, Okay, and that's a lot of that is dependent upon having the right doctor, but taking the medications properly. Okay, because how many people have gotten a prescription, you know, and you get this stack of prescriptions, and it looks like every other prescription you've had, but then you get home and you have these, you have one egg, you have a disc, and then you have a pump, right? And the doctor didn't tell you how to use any of them. He didn't tell you that the order that you take them in makes a difference in how well they work, and he didn't tell you that if you don't gargle and spit after some of them, you're going to develop a fungus in your throat. Oh my God. I mean, and that's the gist of pulmonary medications right there, okay? That's the three pulmonary medications. So we're lucky we have a great doctor coming in two months from New York Hospital to talk specifically about pulmonary medications. It sounds dry, okay? But that's going to be a great, very important lecture for anyone with pulmonary disease. I'm trying to save on time, but I promise I will lecture every time again, but we will cover these things over and over again. So having the right doctor, taking the, the right medications, and taking them properly, okay? Number two, exercise. And each one of these to me is equally important. So we talked about what happens if you get short of breath and you stop doing these activities, okay? All the muscles that you use get weaker, you don't use oxygen as well, and you get short of breath at lower levels of activity. So it makes sense that if you feel better but your pulmonary function hasn't gotten better, as is the case in a lot of situations, it could also, it must make sense that if you feel worse, maybe your pulmonary function hasn't gotten worse, right? Maybe something else is making you feel worse. Maybe you haven't been as active. Maybe you have more stress on the job. Maybe you put on a few pounds, 
all those things can make you breathe worse, okay? So exercise, as you know, is my best piece of advice for you, okay? What we do in there is gonna help you feel a lot better than what you put in your mouth or what you shoot into your throat, okay? Other things, proper nutrition. We talked about that. So it's really important that you try to be at the right weight. So if you are too heavy and you have all this extra weight sitting here, so let's say if we have this and this is fat, okay? The diaphragm's trying to push downward, okay? And the diaphragm pushes downward and that's what causes the ribs to elevate. But now imagine you have 20 extra pounds on each side that's pushing these ribs. So if I put a weight on each side, okay, and said breathe, or I said here's two bowling balls, carry these around all day, you wouldn't get too far before you're exhausted and you're short of breath. And guess what the effect of that is, okay? More acid in the bloodstream, because you're working harder. And remember what acid is, hydrogen ion, right? So that's another thing that's saying breathe, 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 breathe. And if your respiratory system is, is your weak link, it's like if I have a broken arm and you go, Quick, 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 quick. You know, the respiratory system's your weak link, okay? And your body's going, breathe, 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 breathe. We want the whole body to rely on the weak link. It's like you are in a rowing team and you everyone stops rowing except the little guy and you're going, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> Makes sense, right? So the other thing about nutrition, when you have a respiratory problem and you're going, breathe, 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 you're exercising all the time, okay? You are working so hard to breathe that you're burning so many calories every day that some people have the other problem, which is that they lose weight. They lose too much weight, okay? And losing too much weight is very problematic for a pulmonary patient, or really any patient, because often what you lose is muscle, okay? And that's a problem as well. So when it comes to nutrition, it's being at the right weight. So if you're overweight, you want to lose the weight. If you're underweight, you want to gain weight. And when we get to nutrition, We'll talk more about why weight loss, too much weight loss, is a very, very bad thing, okay? And that has to be rectified, okay? And then the other thing is knowing what to eat to help you breathe better. So avoiding the foods that are going to increase your carbon dioxide. And, you know, we talked about putting all this food in here. What about gas, okay? If you have trouble breathing, if you go, <laughs> probably some of that air is going to get into my respiratory, I mean into my GI system, right? Because the trachea and the esophagus are buddies, right? And when this one's closed, this one's open. And when this one opens, this one's supposed to be closed. But sometimes it's like you get caught going out the door and air goes into the GI system when it's supposed to only go into the respiratory system. So imagine now this is also full of air. And that's also restricting the diaphragm, okay? And then on the flip side, sometimes some food goes into the respiratory system, right? And then you can develop a pneumonia and then you can also increase your mucus production. That's nutrition. And I promise you, um, I don't want to take these guys more time, but we will go over these more and more, and I realize I have to make a little more time for myself. Um, other things, stress management, right? So anxiety. You know what the effect of anxiety is? Puts out adrenaline, right? Fight or flight response, adrenaline comes into the, the bloodstream, and you know what adrenaline says to the body? Breathe, 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 breathe. So all these things work, and now, you're stressed out, right? And I'm nervous, so I'm breathing faster. And now that I'm breathing faster, I can't, I'm, I'm having more difficulty breathing and I'm getting more nervous, right? So it's a cycle. And we have to break into that cycle somehow, right? And who the hell thought that all these things affect how you breathe? Now, how many people's doctors talk to them about any of these things? No, they say, here's your prescriptions, right? <laughs> so this is a problem. And that's why I say to doctors all the time, guess what? I know you don't have time to talk about these things, but I do. All I do all day is I watch some people in there for a few minutes, and then I come take care of my fish. So I'll talk about all these things, okay? So I'll come, and I have plenty of time to talk about these things with people. So when you're here, okay, if you have questions, call me. I'll come in, I'll talk for hours about this stuff in the gym. We could have a lecture every day in the gym. Just ask me questions, I'll talk every day, okay? Last thing, prevention of infection, okay? Very, very important because you know what? An infection for you is not the same as an infection for me. So, you know, a, a pulmonary patient or somebody with a respiratory disease doesn't get like a little infection. They get big infections. It goes right to the lung. And if that's your weak link, you have to make sure that you're preventing it because it's a lot easier to prevent it 
than to treat it once you're in a jam. How do you prevent infections? What's the number one way, best way? Wash your hands frequently, okay? We have these things all the time. So you know how we prevent infection? I don't know, maybe you were just standing on the train, right? And you were holding this, and we don't know if the person who was holding it before you just went to the bathroom and if they had any toilet paper at home, and now they're holding this, okay? So now they come in here, okay? And you're touching it, right? So if you come in here, you take this, now this is like a sterile area. So now we know that whatever you did before you come in here when you touch my treadmill is clean. And you notice that we clean every single machine yes. in between every single use because I don't know what's on you. No offense, I like you, you may be a nice person, but you may be filthy. You know what I mean? It's that simple, okay? It may be that. And I don't want it, you know, you see when people come in and say, I have a cold, I, I start going like this. And, you know, I, got, I, I get sick once a year now. I never got sick before. Now I get sick once a year. But this is number one, okay? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. So that means when you come in, please use it. Please, in between machines, you're welcome to use as much as you like. We'll replace it as many times a day. When you come back from the bathroom, wash your hands, okay? You know what's funny? When people go to a casino, right, they always want to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom, right? If you're in a casino, I'd be more worried about washing them before I go to the bathroom. I don't want what's out there to touch me. But same thing here, so think about it. You don't know what you were just touching or who was just here before. So hand washing, what else? Coughing. Coughing, cover up. Okay, so when you come here and you're going, <coughs> right, use your arm because this is bad. But if you do this, we'll give you something to wipe it off with, okay, that will kill it. Now, I'm not joking. It, it sounds funny, but that's how you get sick. Trust me. You get sick when someone goes, <coughs> and they don't cover their mouth, okay? Well, here's another thing. The water cooler, right? So a lot of times someone will say, here, I'll give it to them. And we say, we don't want you to give it to them. Why? Because maybe you're filthy. And so now you're giving this out to everybody here. We don't want you coming here and getting sick. It sounds funny. Funny, but it's true. That commercial where the kids are passing the test up, that's how germs travel. Last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to turn it over because I know I'm way over time, but um, other things, I'm not way over time now that I just saw, I'm, I'm okay. Um, pneumovax, pneumonia vaccine, okay? If you haven't had it, and some people will say you should have it every three years, and some people say you should have it every five years, but ask your doctor, you don't want pneumonia and you don't want the flu, okay? So flu shot every year. I went to the doctor today, she, said, did she, get it? she said, did you get a flu shot? I said, no. She said, you're getting it right now. She said, give me an arm, I got the flu shot, okay? It's very, very, very important. And for those of you that are worried that you're gonna get the flu, if you get the flu from the flu shot, I promise you what you were gonna get, if you didn't get the flu shot, would have been much worse, okay? So get the flu shot get the pneumonia vaccine, and I heard Dr. Oz say something yesterday, which it, did, it never dawned on me, but as soon as he said it, I was like, duh. He said, even if you're not afraid of getting the flu, I can carry something that could be subclinical, okay? So if you have the flu, I could come around you, and I may not get sick, but I may have gotten enough of what you have to give it to you. Yeah. So for that reason alone, I got the flu shot today. Okay, because I don't want to pass it on to somebody else, okay? So, I know that was a real whirlwind. I do wish we had more time, and next time I will plan more time. But, ultimate pulmonary wellness, have the right doctor, take the right medications properly, exercise, nutrition, stress management, relaxation training, which Cynthia is going to touch on, prevention of infection, okay? And then the last thing, is everything else. So no, even if you do all those things, if as you step on the bus, someone steps on your foot and breaks your toe, it <laughs> doesn't matter that you did all those other things. things. Okay? That's showbiz, exactly. Question, doubt it. Quickly, how do you evaluate your doctor? What's that? How can you evaluate your doctor? Do you know what I have the right one? Here's how I would evaluate my doctor. Okay, and I, I have, I, I go to a doctor a lot, okay? I have a chronic disease that I have to see a doctor a lot. So this is how I evaluate it. If you listen to me when I speak to you. So are you on the computer? I've been with doctors who are on the computer. Are you taking phone calls when I'm with you? Are you making phone calls? I had a doctor who was making phone calls. I would say something and say, excuse me for one second, and made a phone call. Now sometimes I understand that you have to take a phone call, but do you have to really make a phone call? I went to another doctor. I, I gave him my history. 
he took my blood pressure, he listened to my lungs. He says, anything else? I said, this is the first time I saw him. I said, are you going to do an exam? He said, what do you mean? I said, are you going to do an examination? He said, well, you have nothing wrong with you, right? I said, well, I'm here because I want you to do an examination so that if I don't feel well, you have something to compare it to. Okay? So that would be a concern to me. And then the other thing is, how serious, I mean, has anyone ever been to a doctor and you're telling them something and you, you just have this sense that they really, it doesn't matter to them? Like, they just don't really actually care about what you're saying to them. They're going, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. But they don't feel it. They don't, it doesn't touch them in any way. It's not in their heart. They don't feel like, oh, Dorothy, you fell down. I'm sorry to hear that. They're just like, oh, okay, so let me write this down so I have something to do. That, those are all bad signs for me. And then the other thing is, how often am I getting sick? You know what I mean? If, if you know, I want to make sure that you don't get sick that much. You know what I mean? Or as little as possible. When you have a chronic respiratory disease or a chronic heart disease, you are more prone to things, okay? But is your doctor giving you the armor, okay? Think of it like you're going out into a battle, okay? And if you're in a, a t-shirt and shorts, then you say, well, do I need anything else? And the doctor goes, nope, you're okay. I'll have any concern, okay? But if he says, well, here, put this helmet on, which is your medications, here. Here's the flu vaccine, which is your armor. Here's this, then, you know, you want a doctor who cares about what you care about. Last question. Okay. Second to last, one more, go. Okay. Quickly, 30 seconds. Done, done. Free about. Free about. The flu shot. Yes. Um, I'm allergic to eggs, so I can't take the, uh, the flu shot. You know? Now, what, I, what I want to know is, as far as the ammonia shot, is that, have, is that related in any way? I mean, is it Different ammonia? formulation. And so, the formulation changes every year. But, but, I mean, if I have a problem with eggs, would I have a problem with the, with the ammonia shot? I don't think so, but ask your doctor. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you it, you don't want to take something that's going to give you an allergic reaction. And, no, you know. I, I just want to. Roger. Can I get to set that? Do I have um, a point? What about, you went through nutrition very fast, so I don't know what I can't eat, but I like pretzels a lot. Okay, have pretzels, don't have that many of them. I'm going to go through all these things. We have time. Like, if you look at the schedule, I'll give you out the whole schedule, but every one of these things that I touched on tonight is going to get its full lecture, and then that's all we're going to talk about. We'll only talk about exercise. We'll only talk about nutrition. We'll only talk about pre prevention of infection, okay? I appreciate the attention. I don't want to take any more time, but... I'm going to let Cynthia and Dina go, and if people want to stay after that, <coughs> I will stay and answer whatever questions you want. Okay? Sorry, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You look so bad. You look so bad. I like that. I like that. So, um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that Noah touched on, including um, the human spirit and stress. Can you speak a little stress. bit? I'll try. It's the air conditioner. Yeah, okay. Uh, I usually sit so we're in a circle, but it's such a big group, you'd never hear me that way. Is that a little better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara asked, too, I want to explain a little bit about what I do, the energy healing, the energy medicine. People typically have a lot of questions about it. and it's not very easy to explain um, unless you've experienced it. But I'll tell you a little bit about my training and my education. Um, although it's called medicine and healing, I have not gone to medical school. I did go to law school. Um, and I think that's important that you know that about me. I also practiced law for many years. Um, the reason that's important is I work on the energy level of somebody's healing. But I work with them, teaching them, coaching them about um, positive thinking, mental um, thought patterns that support health and healing, and how to work with unresolved emotions. So the reason it's important that I've got life experience and worked in some place like a big old law firm is I know what it's like to have work pressure. I know what it's like to have stress. Um, the sort of training, so I really didn't learn about healing there. I did learn about stress there. Um, I have trained in shamanic healing. And shamanic. Do you know what a shaman is? Like a medicine man? Yeah. I've studied with the um, direct descendants of the Inca shaman in Peru. And they create sacred space. And I think what Noah has created here is a lot like sacred space. It's a place where people come together. 
They don't have to be alone to heal. And they can share what's going on with them. And then they also learn from people who can bring them some medicine. And medicine is anything that lifts the spirit and promotes healing. Um, I'm also a Reiki master. Is anybody familiar with Reiki? Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know what Reiki is, it's a natural system of healing whereby the practitioner channels um, life force energy into the recipient or the patient. The National Institutes of Health consider it to be a form of complementary or alternative medicine. Um, Noah mentioned Dr. Oz too, so you're familiar with Dr. Oz? No. No? He is a medical doctor, cardiothoracic surgeon from uh, Columbia Presbyterian, I yes. think, and he has a syndicated talk show on TV. He's really quite good, gives a lot of practical information. Um, he was a pioneer in bringing Reiki practitioners into surgery. They would treat his surgical patients before an operation as well as after. Um, I think his wife's also a Reiki master. Um, so it's a really nice therapy. If you don't know what it is, you're on a massage table, fully clothed. It works with your energy to take out dense, um, let me back up, our energy field so much that uh, needs to get covered. We have an energy field, a luminous energy field. All the different traditions recognize this. They do, what do you, EKG for your heart? Okay, your heart's the biggest electromagnetic field in your body. So at essence, we're energy, although we seem to be kind of solid. So I work in the luminous energy field to remove dense, heavy energies. There are imprints that may be um, even there before you have a disease that it may come to be. And we're learning that, as Noah said, lots of different things go into health and healing. It's not just a matter of do you have this gene or did you come into contact with this germ. Two people may have the exact same gene, but in some people that expresses it as disease and in other people it does not. The same thing is you may you know, come into contact with that flu bug. You may get it and somebody else doesn't. Or you may get it and you don't have as severe a case of the flu as someone. So there are other inputs. You know, Noah also talked about the food you put in your body and your exercise. But if, just like putting junk food in your body, if you put junk thoughts in your mind and hang on to a lot of negative emotion, you're going to create an internal environment that supports disease rather than healing. Is that some of like meditation? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's some of that that I help people with practices. Does anybody, has anyone done meditation? You have? TM. 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 You too? Has anybody, yeah? How does that compare with acupressure? Some of the Asian um, practitioners uh, use that. I mean, is it, they massage you and they talk about meridians and it's like opening up you know, uh, areas, and it sounds, you know, similar to what uh, you're talking about. But is that related, you know, with all It is, it is. That's a great question, because I went really quickly about the energy field. If this is something very interesting, we can go into it more deeply, but I'll answer your question. The practices that I do work with the major energy centers of the body. We have an energy anatomy. I work with what are called the chakras. There are seven major chakras, and chakra means wheel. Um, in the Taoist tradition, they talk about dantians, and those are elixir fields. So these are where your energy comes in and out of the body. Um, I work with these seven, your root chakra, sacral chakra, your will chakra, your heart chakra, throat chakra, you might have heard of the third eye, and then your crown chakra, that connects you to spirit. The meridians um, in the Chinese tradition uh, with acupuncture, those are like the little rivers of light, and they come off the major energy centers. And in, I guess, the Hindu tradition, they're called nadis. So that, that's a very good question. The work that I do, though, is not any sort of pressure, or even, I don't even have to touch. I sometimes touch very lightly the body, other places, particularly if we get into you know sensitive zones, the root chakra, no touching up in the air, and I can be you know like this close to your field or here or high. 
fire, and I can feel your energy field. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might be fun to, to share that with some of you. Um, has anybody experienced that sort of energy healing? Have, has anyone had a healing session? You have, I know. Yeah, you do some of this work. Do you want to share your experience of it with the group? Just. Well, I do it differently, so I, it wouldn't be it wouldn't yeah. be quite the same. As the I meant if you're receiving it. Do you want to? Can you just really quickly share what that feels? I don't like? think I've ever really oh, okay. received from somebody received. that I felt was that developed. Okay. So I, I yeah. Let me just say that. Um, I would say oh, yes. I think I've met it once. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but um, I've met both by the way. sharing that. non-touch and working with an energy field, so I question that. Mm -hmm. Because I, because of my world, I use it to help people go after physical and emotional and spiritual well-being. It's like a support. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a nurturing with them, like that. But I think it's very important to have nurturing touch. So I combine the two of them together. I think your way works wonderfully. <laughs> Lots of different modalities work and they work for different people, and thank you for sharing that, Barbara, because I have seen really amazing things happen with healing, and you never know what's going to happen. You really don't. It's, it's not something I can say, I know this is going to fix whatever you have, but I've seen amazing things where swollen angles that have been swollen, you know, severely sprain down. Um, I worked with someone who had Bell's palsy. Do you know what Bell's palsy is? It a nerve is um, attacked. And in the hospital, they don't really do anything for you with that. So I came in, he was beet red, and he had a patch over his eye. I kept rubbing it because the eye was, you know, sort of, it, it wouldn't blink, but it was tearing. And I said, can I just do a little work on you? Is that okay? And within 10 minutes, pink. Not lobster red anymore, pink. The patch didn't need to be there. And they just don't do anything like that. They just, you'll be fine. So it can be a real assist. Um, and what it does, and I want to talk about what I call essential balance, but I think we should believe in the body's natural healing ability. Your body knows how to heal itself. When you get a cold, I don't know what's happening in there, but the body can fix it. Same thing with the flu. Sometimes if you're really knocked on your butt, you need to go get some town flu or something like that. But otherwise, the body knows how to fix it. So the energy, any type of modality, the work that you do, there are other different, and I, I know Barbara Brennan, but I have not studied. I, I don't, I yeah, don't with do her. that. Yeah, I, I just, you asked that, and I don't think I really got to it. I know who she is, but I have not studied with her. I've read her book. She has a book called Heal, Healing Hands Heal, of yeah. Light or something like yeah, that. Hands of Light. Yeah. Um, but it enhances the body's natural healing ability. And a lot of what makes the difference for someone, too, is their attitude. Are they open? Are, do, are they ready That's to That's what I was going to yes. say, that I feel the mental attitude, the optimism that one has, will help the healing. 
keep that totally. Yeah. Absolutely, it's, it's very important. Um, so this idea of essential balance, I think of this as our natural state. It's a hold and hold, hold, a whole and healed state, and it's a state of ease and flow. Everything is flowing. The breath is flowing. We're at ease. <coughs> We're always changing, life is always changing. Something comes along, whether it's from inside you, a physical um, condition, stress, work stress, um, worrying about paying your bills. Something comes and is added to that natural state. And it puts us in dis-ease. We no longer have that state of ease. I've got a hyphen there. I should probably write, but I'm not quite sure how to use this word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, if we stay in that state of chronic stress, I don't want to go into the whole physiology of it. Noah talked about it a little bit. Um, when you're stressed, um, you go into fight or flight. There are some hormones and neurotransmitters released that have various impact on the body. We're, I know that Noah has planned going very deeply into stress, so I'm sure we'll go. Right now, we're going to go into the whole physiology yep. of, of fight or flight, so I don't want to go into that. But when it happens, if it stays for too long a time and you have chronic stress, it starts to depress the immune system. So to keep it really simple, um, stress doesn't feel very good and it's really bad for you. So I want to start um, in the place of our emotions and when we have something stressful come up, whatever it is. What I found is a lot of us have learned to push it aside. If it's something that we don't feel good about, or if we've got fear or anxiety, we kind of don't want to acknowledge it and we put it away. But it stays there. It has a grip on you. And it can keep those hormones and neurotransmitters, keep them going in your body and keep that state of chronic disease. So one thing I want to share with you is to acknowledge and honor whatever emotion you have. If it's anxiety about a physical condition, if it's fear, just allow yourself to have that. And then don't put more on top of that because we tend to really criticize ourselves and judge ourselves. If I'm anxious or fearful, then I think, oh, I'm weak. And you know, it's not. We, we all have these concerns. So the idea is to take the space of being a benign observer of your own life, being a real witness to what's going on inside of you, and, and developing a compassion and a real empathy for yourself. So, how many people have stress? Okay. If, if you were, uh -huh. and you live in Manhattan, okay. you know, I mean, how can you, you know, not have stress? So when you say acknowledge it, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do acknowledge it, and most of the stress occurs in the office, you know, so I do acknowledge it, and the minute that I do that, I go into a breathing mode, you know, I just, you know, walk away from my desk, and I do this, this breathing, and here, I just started here, and um, I was taught by one of the therapists, you know, how to breathe, and I, and I find that, you know, that it really, you know, diffuses what's going on in that house. So, uh, I, how much does that, you know, really work into getting rid of the stress? I think it, the breathing, you know, just step away from the stress for a while and do that, uh, the breathing. That is brilliant, and you jumped ahead. That's our next I'm part, sorry. we're gonna breathe. But I wanna stay for a moment with the acknowledgement, and also what you said about work, um, the statistics are that I think it's 85% of people find work to be incredibly stressful. So it's a lot of stress. Um, do we have time to do the sharing exercise? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. But yes, you can do it. Take as, as All right, we'll do it really fast and then we're going to breathe because breathing is very important. So what happens when you're stressed? You tend to contract yes. and you tend to hold your breath. So. Typically, we tell somebody, right, who's really stressed out, breathe, and it's excellent advice. And this brings us back to the human spirit again. We might think this is simple, 
and kind of dismiss it. Oh, it's just breathing. <coughs> but the breath is a really powerful tool. Just because it's natural, just because it's simple, doesn't mean it's not powerful. Um, and all of the mystical traditions think of breath as intimately connected with the human spirit. Breath begins, you know, life begins with your first breath, and it ends with your last breath. And it brings you back into that place of being centered. Um, let's do the sharing exercise, though. I think it might help, because there were a lot of hands that said they were stressed. So this is what I'd like to do, is, and I think it's a really good thing to do, because when I tell you acknowledge it, when someone tells me something, I say, oh, but if I actually try it and do it as an exercise, I'm more likely to remember how that felt. So what I want to invite you to do, we'll go around the room, I want to invite each of you to share something that is either you're causing you stress now or typically causes you to experience stress. And I don't want a life story, just, you know, we don't have time. Three words or a sentence at most. And then I want us all to practice being that benign observer and just having compassion for each other. So we'll listen, and after each person says what, what it is that's causing them stress, I want everyone to participate and just say, I hear you. Okay? I'll go first. And, oh, if you don't want to share, just say pass, and we'll say, I hear you, because sometimes you don't feel like share. But um, something that causes me stress is having to speak with a group where I don't know them very well. I just met them. It always causes a little anxiety, a little flutter in my heart. And, you know, I feel that adrenaline going. And I, I felt that today, so I wanted to share that with you. Okay, Raja. Okay, in my, my uh, dysfunctional family, of which I am also dysfunctional. But <laughs> And that causes me stress. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Pass. I'm sorry, I don't know your names. Right. Go ahead. So, I said pass. Oh, pass. Oh, I hear you. Pass. Yes. Oh, is there something? Yeah, I'm stressed out for a lot of things, you see. And then I calm down and I'm very happy. I hear you. It's in me, you know? Absolutely. Deadlines at work, sometimes. I hear you. Well, I hear you. work one day. Well, today my boss told us that we had a deadline that we could not possibly meet, even if we had to work. We could not possibly miss unless, and we had to work 28 hours a day to do it, we would do that. That stresses me out. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I, I think being in pain and not having the knowledge how to correct it and where to go and get the knowledge to do it. I hear you. That drives me crazy. When I can't get the, the immediate uh, answer to something I need, I hear you. Thank <laughs> you. 
get stressed out when I have to speak in front of people too. And also I'm stressed out because I can't find my glasses. Right now when I when I when I think the illness that I'm going through uh, had gone through and it was so um, 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 what um, what a, what a, I've heard about my family, death, and so I'm stressed that's going to be Yeah, but it hasn't taken away your smile. A beautiful <laughs> smile. Thanks. All right, I, I'm going to have to turn it over to Dina, but before we do that, I want to do real quick breathing. We're not going to do the whole big, long breathing. We're going to, next time, I will share with you some breathing for relaxation, but we can do three breaths together. Um, I call it the awe breath. And when I'm really stressed out, I do this lying down in bed. And you can do it for as long as you like. You breathe in deeply. And then you exhale saying, ah. And when you do that, you can take all of the tension out of your body if you just keep breathing. But let's just do three of them together now. Okay? So inhale. And ah. Yes, let it just fall out of you. And inhale again. Inhale. And ah. Great. One more time. Deep inhale. Ah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have a breathing that I Answer any questions that anybody wants to talk about afterwards. And if you want to run to the men's room or ladies' room right now, now would be a good time to do it. Men and the men's, ladies and the ladies' room. That's the only <laughs> trick. You and your rules. I have a lot of rules. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't Don't leave. Don't leave. Well, I'll get to get away I love you. Yeah. 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 If anyone's in the 8.30 session tomorrow, you're welcome to stay. for a moment. I know people were transitioning a little bit, but it would be best if you could move your chair in a way that you have a little bit of free space, that if you put your arms in front of you, your arms to the side of you, and even maybe a little behind you, you wouldn't hit anybody. Okay. And I am having some therapy on my arm. This Can't put really them behind me. <laughs> Not a problem. And I'm actually, when everyone gets back, I'm going to check in with you guys on that. So thank you for saying that. And if you have a little space for your legs in the front, that would also be beneficial. Here and see how we feel little by little. Yeah, just a little more to the front. No guys, through. So actually, maybe we could start with that. So we have some injuries with arm, shoulder joint, or arm? shoulder into the muscle that's right here. The tricep. Okay, so if there anything at any point in time bothers you, just you can keep it small or just minimal at all. You can use visualization to think about the way the patterns of movement would travel. And I've okay. had two arms I can use the other one. You could also do that, absolutely. <laughs> um, but be mindful of that arm as well. Right? I'm constantly mindful. Yeah, it doesn't count right. Anyone else with any injuries or anything that, that's bothering with that, bothering them at this time? <coughs> yes. It doesn't actually bother me, but my spine is used. Ah, okay. I'm sorry, which part? T3 to the sacrum. Okay. 
Okay. All right. That's good to know because we do a lot of lengthening exercise and breathing work that helps to create more space in the spine. Anyone else? All right, so maybe we can get started. Is that all right, Noah, if we got started? Yep. All right, so I'm going to play some music, because I ended up playing some music with uh, all my classes. And we usually start, I'm going to give you a little taste of what I do. I normally teach the class in about an hour. Um, we have uh, other artists that do teach this type of class, and we all kind of bring our own energy and spirit to the class, but the format is pretty much the same. So if you can start sitting, and I may get up too, especially if you can't see me, and you want to be seated in a way that both feet are up the floor in front of you, and your knees are directly over your toes, you may not be all the way back, if you're a shorter person like myself, my feet dangle, so I'll come a little more forward. So my feet are flat on the floor. And there is weight going down into my feet, but my pelvis is supported by the chair. So you can even give yourself a little rock side to side to just feel those two sits bones, bottoms of your pelvis into the chair. Sitting up nice and tall, having your shoulders over your hips, Finding length within your spine, I'm going to ask you to draw your hands together at your heart center and rub them together a little vigorously, create some heat energy. And we're going to go right to our chest today. I want to talk a lot about breathing, so we're going to start right there. And it was really nice, Cynthia opened this up to some nice breathing, that felt really good. <laughs> so we're going to come back to our heart center, and we're going to just think about breathing in through our nose and inflating the chest, the upper chest, inhaling in through your nose right under those hands and releasing the air out through the nose. Taking another breath, just focusing on the chest, upper chest. <coughs> Exhaling out through the nose. If it helps to close your eyes, you can do so. Inhaling through your nose. Exhaling through your nose. And I ask you to draw your attention and your hands down towards your belly. So we're going to now think about the air coming through our nose, through the back of the throat, in through that chest that we just opened up, through the ribs, intercostal muscles, those muscles between the rib cage stretching wide. We're going to inhale, allow that diaphragm to fall down and create more space for air. So here we go, taking a breath in through that nose. Back of the throat, see it traveling through the chest. See it traveling, dropping the diaphragm, letting more air in. And at the fullness of it, begin to then exhale under that belly, under those hands, out through the belly, back up through the center, middle of the chest, upper chest, back of the throat, out the nose. So now that we have an idea of the path, we're going to take three together. Inhaling through the nose, back of the throat, upper chest, middle chest, widening the body. Lower chest, lower abdominal muscles, and exhaling out through your abdominal muscles. Middle of the chest, upper chest, throat, and out the nose. So creating a little more awareness of our body and the connection of breath. I missed the beginning part. So, so we're just going to start a little movement. We're starting with breath, and then we're going to travel into the body. Do you have any injuries or anything I should know about <laughs> that may be hard for you to move? No, no. We I was in the laser. No, I was just checking in with everybody's bodies tonight to see how you feel. <laughs> so if you had anything in your neck, I heard some things about people's backs and arms. All okay so far? Okay, that's all you missed so far. <laughs> all right, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to turn on some music and we're going to continue this. So being mindful of your breath, but sitting up nice and tall. So not only are we breathing forward and back body, but we're also breathing side. We're thinking of a voluminous 360 breath. Breathing really, really round. Here we go. Inhaling the arms up next to the ear. Exhaling down through prayer. So I do integrate a lot of yoga in my work. I practice regularly and I really enjoy the breath and the mindfulness with breaths and movement. Inhaling up and pressing the palms down, exhaling. Mindful of the breath. And you can stick with inhaling and exhaling through your nose. Inhaling through the nose. Arms draw up. We're going to stop right here. And as we lengthen our arms, fingertips are reaching to the sky. Center of the palms are reaching. Feel the shoulders drop down. Yes, now we're creating more space in the neck. Your head is light as a balloon. It's lifting up to the sky, but your pelvis is heavy like a sandbag. 
Lifting down to the chair. Pressing the palms together. Take your focus up this time. Looking at your hands. Take a deep breath in through your nose. And on the exhale, draw those palms down right through the center of your body. Focusing into the hands. Inhaling here. Breathing wide elbows. Inhale. Exhaling through the nose. Inhaling through the nose. Exhale, just bring those palms up on that exhale. Float them all the way up. And then opening the hands back two, width of two feet width apart and roll the wrists down. Two, three, four, five. Big circles, seven, all the way down to eight. We're going to reverse the wrist roll inward. One, two, three, four, five, six. All full eight counts, seven. Eight, one more step to come down, giant wrist roll. Two, three, four. Picture these bubbles in the fish tank. If you're playing with the bubbles in the center of your hands, and your hands are floating around the bubbles, so they're being carried. Up we go, circling inward. Last set we have here. Yes, everyone, beautiful dancers. And left those arms to float down through the center, just like waves. Lifting our head now, going to our neck and head joint. Hands can rest easy on the thighs. Again, checking in with our feet. We do have some weight in our feet. Lifting the chin up to the sky ever so slightly, just creating a long throat, and then dropping the chin to the center of the chest. Again, lifting the chin up to the sky. Put your nose to the sky, creating a long throat, long breath. Take a nice deep breath in here, and on your exhale, drop the chin into your chest. Check in here that your shoulders are released down. Bring your head back to center. Tipping your ear on over to the right side of the body. Just stay here for a moment. Take a nice deep breath. And imagine the air opening up the left side of your neck. Inhaling. Exhaling. Ear drops further towards the shoulder. Inhale. And exhale. Bring the head up back to center. Feel that length on the left as we go over to the right. Dropping the ear on over to the right side. Take a nice deep breath in. Opening up the side of the neck. Exhale. One more deep breath in. Exhale. Bring that head back to center. We're going to do simple isolation up and down. We look up. Two, three, four, and down. Two. And up. Two, three, and down. We're going to tilt the head side to side. Two. Center. Two, three. Four. Up and over, ear to your shoulder, rest that shoulder down, center, simple looking right and left, rotate the head to the right, checking that your shoulders are square, so just thinking and seeing your body, seeing your shoulders are square, bringing your chin over your right shoulder, and bring it back to the center, bringing your chin over to your left shoulder, lengthening up, tall, take a deep breath in here, exhale, get taller, head is floating towards the sky, Bring that head back to the center. Release those hands from the thighs. Allow these shoulders to come forward, up to the ears. Bring them on back down. Inhaling in. Rotating them back and down your exhale. Inhale them up. Exhale, back down. Check those hands, loose hands. Shake them out, nice and heavy hands. Inhale those shoulders up to those ears and around. And back. We're going to reverse this circle. Take it from the back. Hop it over. Exhaling forward. Again, heavy hands. Like you have fish weights on the end of the hands. Like you're going fishing. You know, arms as fishing poles right now. Up and over. And release down. Come back center. Bring those shoulders up to the ears. Inhale. Dive nice and deep. Inhale. Release and press down to your lax muscles. Your lotus is dorsi on the side. Inhale up. Shoulders next to the ears. Release. Picture the weight of those hands drawing your shoulders down. Those bones on your back, the scapula down. Inhale those shoulders up to the ears. Exhale down. Beautiful, everyone. You're creating so much length in your spine. Inhale up. That's it. Exhale down. Very nice, everyone. We're going to clasp the hands together, fingertips together. We're going to stretch between the shoulder blades. So pressing those palms forward. You're going to take a contraction. Allow the head to drop center. Feel an opening in the chest and, excuse me, a closing in the chest, but an opening in the shoulder blades. Take a deep breath in. Feel the back expand. And exhale those arms up to the sky. Inhale, shoulders up. 
Keep the length in the spine, but release your shoulders down. Let them cast the like a waterfall down your back. And open those arms, allow the arms to float down. We're going to take some port de bras or carriage of the arms. So floating the arms up. Center, first position. Up to high, fifth position. Opening those arms to second position, maintaining length, maintaining length in the body. Float the arms up to second position. Drop them on down, first position, straight up through the center. Now freeze right here. Imagine you have this voluminous, big beach ball in your hands. Right in your arm, someone inflated this beach ball, so it's causing your arm muscles to lengthen around the ball. You try to grab the other side of your fingers, but at the same time, your shoulders are relaxed. Cascading down the back when you're tall. Take this beach ball right up over your head. And as you take it up over your head, find those six bones rooted in your chair. Your feet are strong on the floor. Deep breathing here. Don't forget your breath. Inhale. And we can smile too. Burns calories, doesn't it? Inhaling. And exhale. And with those arms in the air, can you look forward and still see your fingertips out the corner of your eyes? If not, bring them more forward. Opening those arms, this ball is getting wider and wider and wider. Fingertips are tracing, it's beautiful, the outside of the ball, bringing it all the way down. Taking a breath in, and releasing down. Nice work. I'm going to just do a little bit with the legs. At this point in the class, I usually continue the progression through the body. We go through the hips, we go through the legs, we get just standing and book in. Tonight we're going to take it a little bit easier though but I don't want to forget our legs. So let's bring our knees a little closer together, and let's take a moment to just squeeze those legs together. Squeeze those inner thighs together. And it may even help to put your hands on your legs to draw a little more attention to that area. And then I want you to release the legs. Oh, feel what it feels like to release that tension. And again, drawing into the center line of the body. So that's strength when you pull into that center line of the body. See if you can feel everything drawing in, drawing in, pulling up. And then release. So now let's add some breath to it. I feel like some of you are not breathing right now. Let's inhale and contract inwards, that midline, that center line of the body. Without tension, just think of the body drawing inward. And then releasing, opening up. Looming like a flower. So something like that. One more. In, coming into the midline of the body. Tight, tight, pulling it up, pulling it up, pulling it up. And then allowing it to release. Allowing it to release, 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 release. Good. Take your right leg, stretch it on forward as far as you can. Point those toes, press them to me, point your toes all the way to me. Let me feel everyone's toes pointing towards me. Everyone's toes. I want to be able to touch your toes. And then flex your foot. So now you're reaching your heel towards me. So you feel energy from your heel. Release the shoulders. Breathe. Ah. And bring that leg down. And we bring up our left leg. Point your feet. Point those toes forward. So we're not scrunching, but we're reaching our toes as an energy. Rays of light are coming out of our toes. Beautiful. And flex. So you feel the reach of the heel. Now we're engaging the hamstring muscles. Or the back of the leg. Really step down. Bringing up the right leg one more time. Go for an ankle circle on four. Outside three. Remember those bubbles in the fish tank? Well, now they're dancing around your feet. And reverse it around. Two. And three. And four. Let's try one more flex and point. Flex. And point. Bring it down. Five. Six, seven, switching legs, and up, two, flex the foot, here we go, release that foot, and full circles, two, three, and four, reverse the ankle, circle, one, so bringing some mobility to the joint, lubricating the ankle joints, flexing and pointing, flexing, reaching that heel, reach it, reach it, reach it, stretch it forward, point those toes, and release the legs down to the floor, nice, shake out those legs. In fact, shake out your thighs. Have a moment to do that. So at this point, dancers, I would have continued moving on with legs. I would have gotten up standing, learned a little dance routine combination, but I want to close you out with just a little breath. So we're going to start the way, finish the way we began, let's bring our arms up. Take a nice deep breath in. Reconnecting to the breath, reconnecting our focus to our hands. So our chin lifts up, and you're stretching and lengthening the back of the neck, not dropping it down. Eyes to the fingertips as you exhale, draw it down through center. Bring those arms forward, inhale. Focus to the fingertips. Exhale back to the heart center. Inhale those arms up. Focus on up. Palms separate. 
and feel the energy and space around you as they float down. Your eyes come back to center, and you maintain this length that you've created. So hopefully you all feel a little taller, a little more mobility in the upper body. Do you um, stop there and ask if you have any questions for me? Well, I do. Mm -hmm. It's hard to watch and do at the same time. Yeah. So how did you get around that? So I, I find um, it is hard to watch and do at the same time. I agree. And I think, you know, setup is one way that we can work on that with how we are placed. Mm -hmm. um, also with more time. I do break things down a lot, and when I see you over time, the exercises are repeated and developed. So we continue. So head isolation is going to a whole series, goes into shoulders, goes into rib cage, goes into stomach. So we continue to build, and obviously as I get to know my students better, I get to understand what they need, and then we work that way. So I think there's an understanding and a relationship that gets built over time that I probably can't do in a quick session. Okay. Actually, it's nice to watch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can I speak I to that also? Yeah, absolutely. This might be useful, but I also found that um, I can often listen to the instructor. And if she says head to the right, I can do it and trust that if I'm not doing it correctly, she'll let me know. So I don't have to always watch. Do you understand what I'm saying? You work together? I, yes, mm -hmm. we do. But okay. also when I train with other instructors, I found that they will often tell you what you need to know. So you can listen maybe and not look as if they say turn your head to the right, you know what that is. And if you are doing what they need, they will let you know. So you can relax a little more and not have to feel that you have to watch the whole time. Well, it's the use of, it's like, I get that the use of your hands and the way your arms go mm -hmm. and all that. You have to, I have to watch first time around. Right, right. I know, but that's an option too. I know even when I take class, sometimes yeah. I need to watch you the teacher. Watch the yeah. yeah, and then jump in next. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's why we repeat things. That's why no, no. is I, I would want to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And ask, of course. <laughs> always ask your teacher questions. So I know oh, after class, great. my students will always come and I will spend time talking and going through some of the movements and the exercises. Okay. And in so. the future, we can use mirrors as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. That is, what? That's a really mirrors. great teaching tool. Oh, no. Well, it's good. You well, see yourself. You can see yourself. You can see right, it's different. You can look at someone else in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, try to move their arms. See what it does for you. The thing is, you imagine I would just breathe. That's good. It's my timekeeper. Boy, that's good. <laughs> I'm a metronome. Did you have a question, Judy, in the back? Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't see your bio before this, so I apologize. That's okay. Have you been working with people with respiratory issues for a while? This is actually something very new to me that Noah has introduced me with. Uh, introduced me to, excuse me. I've been working with an older adult population um, in Queens, and I started doing so with uh, performance. I would go into nursing homes, senior centers, and then I started getting grant work for bringing in movement programs. So, um, although I haven't been working with people with respiratory, respiratory issues, I'm learning about them, I'm learning about them through working with people. It's something that I want to continue to educate myself more. I don't know enough. And um, working here or working with you is a resource as well. Um, but I do, on the other hand, work with students from young to older. And um, that has also contributed to my experience in teaching dance and teaching these kind of classes. Yeah, of course. So thank you, Dina, and thank you, thank Cynthia. You. And thank all of you for coming. I know this was a long session and hopefully a worthwhile session. If anyone has questions for any of us, I'm more than happy to stay and answer questions that maybe weren't clear. Or if you've had enough and you want to get the heck out of here, by all means, have a good evening. Um, but thank you for coming. Next month, controlled breathing techniques. So we will review the anatomy and physiology of the lungs and the respiratory system and teach you more effective breathing techniques. And the date... No, I'm really And that one's coming up quick. That's on, on February 13th, a Wednesday. Yeah, but when does Dr. Zepeda come here? In the third month. March? Yes. So please put your garbage in that bath in that basket in the back. What about what? Do you have a schedule for the rest of the month? No. I do, but it's it's still under under uh
under top secret. So. <laughs> Good. I haven't seen you in a while. I know. How you doing? Does anybody need a car service or anything like that? Uh, does anybody want a car for a living? I know. What's that? I need a car. You do? A car service? Did everybody sign in? That was here.